Hello everyone, my name is Anurag and on behalf of Indo-American Chamber of Commerce, I welcome you all to this virtual seminar. Today's topic is impact, impact of, tax in, of India tax changes on NRIs like us. Many of you have joined from different parts of the globe and I thank you all from the bottom of my heart. These are trying times and I urge you all to stay safe. Who would have thought that this pandemic will really change the way we live now, just a few days ago. My enriching association with the Chamber began in the fall of 2016. At that time, as a co-founder of iValley Innovation, a fintech incubator, I was deep into organizing meetups, hackathons, fintech conferences, and everything in between. For fast forward, the board last year found me qualified enough and made me a board member. So here I am now, as a board member, your MC for today's event. Before we start the event, I will quickly go over today's format. We will begin with a very brief introduction and then dive straight into our presentation of the day. That will be followed by about 15 to 20 minutes uh, question and answer Q&A session. We will then end with a very short closing remark. Now for the, for the Q&A session, uh, some of you have sent in your questions and our experts will answer them. But for, and, and for the rest of you, rest of you who are attending today's uh, seminar, if you have any questions, please direct them to Gita. Uh, Gita is the Gita Ramakrishnan. Uh, you can, uh, you know, find her in the chat box as, you know, ICAISF admin, and you can privately send her your questions, you know, uh, and then Gita will, you know, then moderate and, you know, she will uh, forward them to our experts as we go forward. Uh, uh, so let me straight dive into this uh, today's presentation introduction. I would like to introduce Atma Deal. He is the president of our chamber, Indo-American Chamber of Commerce. So here you, uh, here I'm presenting Sri Atma Deal in front of you, and he, Sri Atma Deal will, Mr. Atma Deal will tell something about the chamber and our activities to all of us. Mr. Atmadhyal, the mic is yours. So I want to welcome everyone uh, who's joined in uh, to this webinar. And so again, thank you for attending. And um, they, I just wanted to say that the chamber uh, has been doing these events uh, for several years and we do uh, at least six to eight per year, but it looks like this year, we might do more of the webinars. Um, so we're living in very kind of different times with the COVID-19 um, and shelter in place, especially here in California and many counties. So this is kind of the way uh, things are being conducted right now. Um, the chamber has been around for over 20 years um, and uh, has been very active and uh, we would like to uh, have uh, people join the chamber once they, if they like what we are presenting and uh, we will be having another uh, event uh, later this month. Uh, it will be on telemedicine. Um, and um, these first two events uh, we typically have are on taxations. And we want to thank Dr. Ahuja for uh, agreeing to uh, join and participate and uh, give his, uh, uh, his input on the new tax changes. And maybe he can also uh, shed some light on the new stimulus package uh, that uh, India is, has put out. At least we're hearing some of it, not all of the details. Uh, and uh, having said that, I'd like to again say thank you and uh, and we hope to see you on our next webinar uh, you should you will be receiving emails from us kind of detailing the when the next one is going to be uh, having said that i will send it back to anurag uh, to move it forward again thank you Thank you, Atmaji, uh, for telling about Indo-American Chamber of Commerce and the activities that we do. Uh, as you all know, today's uh, uh, event has been organized by 
uh, Indo-American Chamber of Commerce and San Francisco chapter of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of India. Uh, our speaker of the day is tax luminary and author, Dr. Gurish Ahuja. Dr. Ahuja will be supported by Neeraj Bhatia from Bhatia and Company. Dr. Gurish Ahuja is a well-known authority on taxation in India who has been practicing as a chartered accountant for nearly 50 years, PhD from Faculty of Management Studies. Dr. Ahuja was nominated by the Government of India as a member of Task Force for redrafting the Indian Income Tax Act, a report of which was submitted to the Finance Minister in August 2019. He has also been nominated by Government of India as Independent Director to the Board of State Bank of India as well as Unitech Limited. He has authored over 25 books on direct taxes for students and professionals. Hear from him. Hear from a veteran who has delivered over 3,200 lectures worldwide on the issue of direct taxes and who has drawn packed audiences during his presentation on union budget. Neeraj is an accomplished accounting professional with 35 plus years expertise in international and domestic tax planning, accounting, compliance for startups and multinational entities. I just want to introduce and hand over the mic to Geeta Ramakrishnan. Geeta Ramakrishnan is the founder member of the San Francisco chapter of in Institute of Chartered Accountants of India, and she is also the current chairman. Uh, Geeta, here you go. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I, my name is Geeta, and I'm the chairperson um, uh, of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of India, the San Francisco chapter. I know that the Institute probably needs no introduction um, in a forum such as this, uh, but for those of you who may not be familiar with what we do, uh, the Institute is the preeminent uh, finance and accounting body of India, founded by Parliament. Um, we like to think of ourselves as, um, as a partner in nation building, um, you know, aside from, of course, the accounting standards and the, account and the auditing standards and uh, uh, the partnering with the government that we do on uh, national tax policies and so on. Uh, today, the footsteps of the Institute is all over the world, as you know. There's more than 250,000 chartered accountants all over, uh, many of them, of course, in India, but many more um, also outside of India. Um, and the San Francisco chapter is one of over 30 chapters or overseas branches um, of the Institute. Um, our purpose is to bring together um, all chartered accountants here in the U.S. Uh, to, to promote the costs of uh, knowledge development, of professional development. Um, yeah. So towards this end, uh, we hold events every month. Uh, some of them are professional in nature, but some others are, are, of, are of general interest, business, uh, things happening in society, uh, just things of general interest. Um, these events are open to the public many times. Uh, we invite you to our LinkedIn page, ICAI San Francisco, uh, or our Twitter handle at ICAI SFO, or indeed our website at ICAISFO.org um, to see, uh, to, to get an idea of what these events are like and to find out when these events are. Uh, we would love the opportunity to have you join us. I see today people from all across the world, just um, uh, I think Anurag mentioned that. Um, a special welcome to all of you. Um, I see uh, Dr. I see Basant Kumar Dugar, uh, founding chairman from Thailand. Uh, a shout out to you. Um, and uh, with that, I think I'll just hand it over to the star. Chartered Accountants of today, um, take it away. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, it's and good, good evening, good morning, and good afternoon, depending upon where in which part of the world you are. Uh, 
hope you all are staying safe and uh, taking all precautions for yourself and your loved ones in this crisis situation. Uh, you must have read the profile of uh, Dr. Ahuja. He actually doesn't need an uh, introduction. He's one of the senior most uh, charity accounts of India. He was my professor in Shiram College uh, for two years, actually. Um, many of you, uh, the early, uh, many of you must have read his books on costing and direct taxes and, and also. Uh, oh. We'll uh, uh, turn to Dr. Ahuja. So uh, our first topic we want to talk about is uh, we want to ask your uh, views on residential status. We hear a lot of changes have taken place. First, we were hearing that uh, the Indian laws have been changed regarding residential status. They have been wanting to tax the stateless citizens. But then later on, we heard there are some changes when the final finance act was passed. So uh, let's hear your views on that. Thank you. Good evening to all in the U.S. and of course, good morning to the uh, persons who have joined from India. Uh, the president of the Indo-American Chamber of Commerce, Atma Dehaldi, uh, founder, uh, sorry, chairperson of the San Francisco chapter of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of India, Geeta, uh, Geeta Ramakrishnan Ji, Anurag Singh Ji, the host for you today's function, Bhatia's brothers, of course, Neeraj Bhatia is from California and uh, Mr. Suraj Bhatia is from Delhi. He's also joined the program today. Well, Manjul Bhattaraji, yes, of course, senior to me. I will should welcome, and she's the only chartered accountant to say in those days. Very good. And she's the, also the ED, I'm told, of the Indian American Chamber of Commerce. Well, the gentleman from uh, 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 Thailand, you also mentioned Mr. Dugar, is, is also there. And from India, I have Suraj Bhatia ji, of course, uh, uh, advocate uh, Mr. Sanjay Sharma ji and Arunika happens to be my student. Of course, she is also there joined from Delhi. I, so, ladies and gentlemen, let me first tell you that we have followed the footstep of US in regard to residential status. Let me tell you what is this. I remember when this bill was presented, finance bill is presented, been presented by my, Madam Sita Raman on 1st of February. And I, had deliver, I was delivering a lecture on webinar from Institute of Chartered Accountant Premises. And at that particular time, when I was delivering that lecture relating to residential status, we got about 400 queries from UAE particularly. Different places. Sir, what is this? What kind of a law you have made? What kind of a thing it is like that? Why they said what kind of a law you have made? Because I redrafted the income tax law of the country which is yet to be uh, yet to uh, take a light of the day, but still we have redrafted and given to the finance minister. So that what have you done? I said, don't worry, I'll come over because I was supposed to go to Dubai, uh, 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 Muscat also, Kuwait and other places. I told them I'll come. I went there. They were really, engaged. They, what kind of a law is this you have made? And we will all be put into difficulties. I told them there is nothing to worry, but still they were not agreed to take a tax residency certificate of that country. And there were a lot of other problems. I came back, had a good discussion with the CBDT chairperson, a chairman, and he was very kind <coughs> enough to give me an appointment. And we discussed at length. And let me tell you, at one time, the finance minister was my student only. Mr. Neeraj uh, Bhatia knows he's also from Shiram College of Commerce. And Mr. Gekli was also from Shiram College of Commerce. So he used to listen to me and that's why everybody knew me and came back and the law is wholly changed. Now I'm coming to the new law. You will have to give me a little time to make you understand because you are not uh, from, uh, or you don't remember now the law of India. But let me come back to that. We have section six of the Income Tax Act, which talks about section one. It talks about an individual is said to be resident in India in the previous year, if he has been in India for a period or periods amounting to all 182 days in the relevant previous year. So if you are in India for 182 days, you are citizen, you are non-citizen, you are foreigner, doesn't make any difference, you are a resident in India. But if you don't satisfy the first condition, then we go to the second condition that in the four preceding previous year, immediately preceding the relevant previous year, he should have been in India for 365 days or more, and in the relevant previous year, just for 60 days or more, you were supposed to satisfy both the conditions. 60 days in the current year and 
55 days in the court proceeding. Previous year in US is a different thing. 31 days and uh, total three years. You know that 183 days. I'll come to that. But here, 60 days in the current year and 365 days in the court proceeding previous year, you become resident. But then I remember we had given a concession. There was an explanation that if you leave India in any previous year for employment abroad, this 60 days will be substituted by 182 days, meaning thereby you could live in India for 181 days and then leave India for employment. You are not taken as a resident. You could live for 181 days and the moment you are here for 182 days, everybody is a resident. So that concession was there. But the second concession is more important for all of you. Please listen to me carefully. What was the law earlier and what is the law which has been changed? Earlier, the law was, it was a clause B in explanation. The law said, in case of a citizen of India or a person of Indian origin, many of you are either citizen of India or person of Indian origin means you have taken up the citizenship of that country. You are person of Indian origin. Uh, person of Indian origin, we call it as either he or his parents or his, uh, what you call grandparents must have been born in undivided India. That is before 1947. Either he himself was born, as I was born, Madam Batra was also born before 1947. So she is, uh, even if she is a citizen of US now, she will be treated, if she's, I don't know, she will be treated as person of Indian origin. But if I was born after 47, then father should have born before 47. Or if I, father was also born after, uh, before, uh, after 47, grandfather must have born before 47, then you are taking it as person of Indian origin. The law is now, in case of a citizen of India or person of Indian origin who, who is outside India, comes to India for a visit. He comes to India for a visit. The period of 60 days in condition number two shall be substituted by 182 days. Meaning thereby, he could come to India for 181 days without being called resident in India. 181 days in the previous year. We have previous year, April to March. You may be having calendar year, April to March. So if you are during the previous year, April to March for 181 days, you are not treated as resident in India. Rather, you could come for 362 days at a stretch, provided you come somewhere in October and leave somewhere in September next year. <laughs> September next year. Why? Because 181 days in one year, 181 days in the next year, you could stay here for 362 days also, without being called resident of India. You know, what is the disadvantage of resident? You have to pay tax on global income. That is the only disadvantage. When you are a non-resident, you have to pay tax only on Indian income. That is the only difference. But no, come back. 182 days. It was not 182 days at one particular time. It was only 60 days. I remember uh, 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 the, uh, Mr. Savraj Paul, during that time, had shifted to UA, UK. And he said to my, Madam Gandhi, because Madam Gandhi was taken as the sister of Savraj Paul those days, he asked Mrs. Gandhi that, look here, I am now shifted to US, I'm, I'm there, but I would like to come to India and do some work here also, or, or do some business here also. But I cannot stay here for more than 59 days, because the moment I'm here for 60 days, I'll become resident. And the moment I become resident, I will have to pay tax to the global income. That was the reason. Then she made raised 60 days to 90 days. I, I'll, I'll, and gradually, 90 days were raised to 150 days, and ultimately, it was raised to 182 days. That means you could come to India for 181 days without being called a resident. Now, what is the change? The, this, this has been, uh, explanation has been extended. I'll explain both the explanation or combine. In case of a citizen of India or a person of Indian origin who is outside India, comes to India for a visit, the period of 60 days in condition number two, which I told you, shall be substituted by 182 days. That was, that is still there, still there. But it has also extended. And in case of a citizen, and this is a new amendment. And in, and in case of a citizen of India or a person of Indian origin who is outside India, whose total income, excluding the income from foreign source, exceeds 15 lakh, exceeds 15 lakh, the period of 60 days 
shall be substituted by 120 days. Please note 120 days. What I'm saying, you are outside India, you are a citizen of India, or you are a person of Indian origin. You want for a visit to India. Come and visit. But look here, if your total income, excluding income from foreign source, exceeds 15 lakh, exceeds 15 lakh, one five, then you can come and stay in India only for 119 days to be called non-resident. The moment you are for 120 days, you will be called resident of India. 119 days instead of 180, uh, 181 days. Please, what is this 15 lakh? Indian income, that is income received in India, deemed to be received in India, income accrue or rise in India, deemed to accrue Indian income. Plus two foreign income. Please, plus two foreign income. One income of a business which is outside India, but it is controlled from India. Whose business? Sole proprietary business. Individual's business, not company. Income from a business outside India, which is controlled from India, or income of a profession outside India, which is set up in India. Now, Neeraj Bhatias is having profession there. That is a different thing. If he had set up the profession in India and was doing some work outside India, then it is income from a profession which is set up in India. You would take a certificate of practice of Institute of Chartered Accountant of India, that means you are established, uh, you are practicing in India, but you may take up the work outside. Then in that case, one is, uh, you have to take that income also, foreign income also. So 50 lakh will include Indian income plus two foreign income only, only two foreign income, no salary income, no house property income, no business also profession income. If you are having it only outside India, nothing to do in India. But if there is a business, which is outside India, but controlled from India, or a profession which is outside India, but set up in India, set up in India, then you will take that income also. And if that exceeds 15 lakh, that exceeds 15 lakh, then you can come to India only for 119 days. 119 days. The moment you are here for 120 days, you become resident. Don't worry, don't become, if you are resident, how does it matter? Because we have tiebreaker rule also with the Indo-US treaty. There are absolutely nothing to worry. But wait here. They have said you can come to India even for more than 120 days and 181 days also. You can come to India for 121 to 181 days. But in that case, you will become resident, but not ordinary resident. We have a concept called resident and ordinarily resident. And we have a concept called resident, but not ordinary. What is the difference between two concepts? Let me tell you. In case of a resident in India, the individual has to pay tax on the global income, even the tax or income on foreign country also, wherever earned. Wait a minute. And in case of a non-resident, you have to pay tax only on Indian income, plus not, I said, non-resident only Indian income, but not ordinary resident. You have to pay tax on Indian income plus two foreign income. One, income of business outside India, but controlled from India. Or income of profession outside India, but set up in India. You include that, and if it exceeds 15 lakh, then you become not ordinary resident. Don't worry, but you will pay tax only on Indian income and these two income. You don't have to pay tax on foreign income. This is one. I don't want to take you to 61A. There is another concept which has been introduced in India. Let me explain to you. Because you also have a concept uh, if you are a citizen of US or you have holding a green card of US, you always become, you have to pay tax on the global income in US. You know that. Citizen of US or a holder of a green card of US or even a resident has to pay tax on the global income. It's a different story that whatever tax you have paid in the foreign country, you get uh, credit for that. That is a different story. But in any case, that is the law in this or your country. But your country means US because your country is also India. It's not that your country is not India. We always welcome you in India. So there is nothing to say your country in US, the, I will say. Coming back. Now, what they have done. If you are not liable to pay tax in foreign country, let's say you are in Bermuda, 
you are in Bahama, you are in what you call UAE, you are in uh, Kuwait, you are in uh, Bahrain, or you are in, let's say, Muscat. There is no liability to pay tax, no tax. And if your total income in India exceeds 15 lakh total income, somebody has raised the question, will total income include a non-resident external account interest? Sir, that is exempt. We don't take in total income the exempt income. So if there is an interest on non-resident external account, which is exempt in case of all non-resident, let me tell you that is not to be included in the total income. Whatever exempt income is there, not to be included. But suppose the, this is a person in UAE or in Dubai. In Dubai, his total income in India is 15 lakh, including those two sources, 15 lakh. Then he will be deemed to be resident in India. Please note the word, deemed to be resident in India, even if he does not come to India for one day. Even if he does not come to India for one day, he will be deemed to be resident in India. The uh, Mr. Bhatia pointed out stateless persons, but it is not stateless. Even those countries, if you are there in Cayman Island, you are in Cayman Island, you are in Dubai, you are in uh, Kuwait, you are in uh, Bermuda, you are in Bahama, there is no tax. So if you have a total income in India, more than 15 lakh taxable income, you will be deemed to be resident in India, come what may, whether you come to India for a day or even for one day or you don't come at all. But what will happen? Nothing. You have to pay tax on Indian income. Plus, you have to pay tax on a business which is outside India, but controlled from India, or a profession which is outside India, but set up. That's all. That's all the change. That's Indian income, so you are also paying the tax. But wait now. I again come back to you after explaining to you. Suppose you become resident in India because you come to India for 120 days or maybe 120 days to 181 days. I told you you'll become not ordinary resident. But if you come to India for 182 days, you will become resident. Doesn't matter. We have a treaty with Indo-US treaty. In case of Indo-US treaty, there is you can become resident in two countries. You, can, you may be a resident of US also, and you may be a resident of India also, because you came to India for 120 days, you become not ordinary resident, or you come to India for 180 days, two days, you become resident. Then we look into the treaty. When you are a resident of both the country, we have to apply tiebreaker rule. Let me explain this tiebreaker rule in a simplified manner. You know, India won the match from New Zealand recently in T20. There was a match which was tied. Two matches were tied. And what do you do in two matches when they is tied? You play a super over. And whosoever, whichever team scores the maximum is treated as winner, declared as winner. But by chance, if the super over also, you, uh, you score the same, point, uh, same runs, then again super over is played. Just you keep on playing the super over till one team becomes the winner by having more runs in that over. Similarly, we have a tiebreaker rule with all treaties, even U.S. also. In a tiebreaker rule, if you are resident of both the countries, we will always see where you have a permanent home. If you have a permanent home in U.S., then you will become non-resident of India. And if you have a permanent home in both the countries, as well as U.S., as well as in India, then we go for the, again, there is a tie. We go for another tiebreaker rule. The another tiebreaker rule is where you have an economic interest or your vested interest, a personal interest, economic interest or vested interest. If you have a more economic or vested interest in US, you become non-resident, although you were resident, but you will become non-resident. But again, this is treaty. This is treaty. Again, if you cannot, you, you have permanent of the both the countries and you cannot determine vested interest, then the third tiebreaker is where you are if you have habitual abode, habitual abode, if your habitual abode is US, then you are non-resident of India. If your habitual abode is India, you will non-resident of US. But wait, even if you are non-resident of US, US law says pay tax on the global income. That is a different thing. US says pay tax on the global income. But we will say, no, look here, you have become non-resident. Okay, we will give you some concessions also once you become non-resident. Another tiebreaker, if that also is not finished, then 
of which country you are national. If you are a national of India, you will become resident of India. If you are national of that, you will become non-resident. This is for treaty, you become non-resident. But wait, even if treaty, you become non-resident US, you, that US says you will have to pay tax on the global income because you are citizen of US or you are a, holding a green card of US. That is a different story altogether for US. But for us, if you are there, if you are treated as resident of US, we will declare you on the tiebreaker non-resident of US, there are non-resident of India, you will get many advantages. This is the one which I wanted to tell. So even if you become resident here or resident but not ordinary resident by coming to India for more than 120 days, but not more than 181 days, you become resident but not ordinary. But you are here for 182 days, you become resident and ordinary days. <coughs> difference. Please remember the difference. Please. If you are declared resident, you have to give the details of your foreign income and foreign assets also in your return of income. In your return of income. So nobody wants to become resident in the sense because the moment you have to give the details of the foreign income, many questions may be asked, the sources and everything. Or you may have created a trust outside India or some other uh, signatory power. So people don't want to become resident of India. But if you become not ordinary resident in India, you do not have to give the detail in Indian return of income, your assets of foreign country. You don't have to give assets of foreign country or income of the foreign country. But wait, wait. <laughs> in US, there is FATCA. And FATCA says we will have to give you, have to get the information from all the, they can take information from all the countries. India is also passing on the information, exchange of information in FATCA, which is US. US is more strict. India is more liberal, let me tell you. They are taking into consideration everything. And you know the maximum rate of tax in US for individual federal income tax is 37%, if I'm not wrong. Yes. Starts from 10%, of course, 10, 12, 22, exactly. 24, 30, 35, 37. But then you may have state tax also, state income tax also. Right. You may have even local authority, municipal tax also. We don't have that many taxes in India. You only have to pay tax maximum marginal rate 30%. But unfortunately, due to surcharge, which is recently increased, and that has grossed a little more. But, but, but then your income in, should be more than 5 crore. Then it goes beyond it. Otherwise, if your income is up to 1 crore, it is only 31.2% including uh, uh, education says. If you have more, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, sorry, because 10% surcharge, 50 lakh, up to 50 lakh, 31.2%. If you cross 50 and 1 crore, then it is 33 point, uh, 34 point something, 34.2. If you cross 1 crore, then the uh, surcharge is 25%, 15%. Uh, uh, if you cross 22 crore, surcharge is 25%. If you cross 5 crore, then the surcharge is 30%. It's a cumbersome thing. I never wanted to give you that trouble of remembering that. But at the same time, the maximum marginal rate in our country is 30%. Surcharge has been added recently, but otherwise it is not that much. But in your case, you do have to pay. And now, please, I'm coming to that. This is the story. Now, since you are a citizen of US or holding green card, you have to declare the complete income you have to pay tax in foreign country. You have to pay in US, US to pay. You have to pay. I know that. Global income. But wait. Since there, if you have applied a tiebreaker, or if without tiebreaker also you are non resident of India, if you are without tiebreaker also non resident, or after tiebreaker you become non resident, Look here, look here, the dividend which you receive, now the dividend in the case of Indian company, if they declare a dividend, domestic company, it is now taxable in the hands of the recipient. Earlier dividend tax was paid by the company. As we called, used to call it dividend distribution tax up to 31st March 2020. But after 31st March 2020, if a domestic company declares any dividend, the dividend is taxable in India at the slab rate. Whatever is your slab, whatever is the slab. But wait, in case of a non-resident, the dividend is taxable. One under section 115A at 20%. If you don't apply the treaty, at 20%.
But if you apply the Treaty of Indo-US, then the rate is 25%. It is 25%. But we have the law. You have to apply. If you, if you have fine beneficial law, uh, income tax, you don't apply the treaty. You can pay 20%. But wait, in 20%, you have to include surcharge. We have a surcharge of 10% if your income is above 50 lakh. If we have a surcharge of 15% uh, if your income is above 1 crore. Indian income. Indian income, not foreign income. Indian income because you are non-resident. If that is about that, then only surcharge. Otherwise, 20% as per section 115A, whereas I look your treaty, it is 25%. Yes, if a US company has invested in India and they are holding 10% voting power in Indian company, then treaty says 15% rate of tax. So company can take a benefit at the rate of 15% tax if the treaty, but if you are individual, the tax in US uh, tax as per treaty is 25% dividend if you are non-resident in India, 25%. But our law says pay 20% plus surcharge plus education says you have no problem. We don't want, you don't go to treaty, don't go. So this is dividend. Because the question was when I receive dividend from Indian company, how will that dividend be taxed? I've told you dividend in India is taxed now in the hands of the receipt. But Whatever tax you have paid in India, whether 20% or 25%, you will get credit in US. You, have all, you will get credit in US while paying the tax on global income. Because in US, your dividend will also be included. But you will get the credit of whatever tax you have paid in India, whether at the rate of 20 or 25. I said, why 20? Because by including surcharge, it can go beyond 20 years. At times, if you are more than 2 crore or 5 crore. But if you are less than that, you in, uh, that, that 115A is beneficial. But you get credit of that. Similarly, the interest income which you earn from India, I'm not talking about non-resident external, it is exempt. Interest income, well, it will be taxed in India. It will be taxed in India if you have given that loan in uh, foreign currency at the rate of 20%, if you have given loan. In. But if you go for treaty, the treaty rate is 15%. So you can always, in treaty, there is no surcharge, no education tax. You can always pay tax in India if you are non-resident at the rate of 15%. And you can get the credit of 15% in, in US by giving the tax on global income. You will get the credit for that also. So there is absolutely no worry. So let me tell you for interest, for royalty, for fee, for technical services also, we have a system of taxing the income at 10%. So you, why do you take the treaty benefit? Treaty is only 15 and 20 percent. But in India, you pay on royalty fee for technical services only 10 percent. A non-resident, if he pays 10 percent, he gets the credit of that person in that country also. So there is absolutely nothing to worry. So what I am trying to explain, even if you come to India for more than uh, for 120 days or more, but up to 181 days, you become resident, but not ordinary resident. But by applying a treaty, you can become non-resident. And if you come here for 182 days and you are also resident of that country and you apply treaty, you become uh, non-resident of this country. Somebody asked me, Rule 120 of US. In US, if you are there in the, previous, in the year, current year, 31 days, and in the three years, including the current year, for 183 days, 182 days, I said, I'm not wrong, you become but, resident. But while calculating uh, 182 days, current year you have to calculate full. But one year before you have to take it one third of the total stay. And two years before you have to take one sixth of the total stay. I give the example. Suppose you were in, uh, you were in US for 120 days and each three years. For past three, three years, you are for 120 days each year. Current year 120. Last year 120, uh, previous year also to that is 120. What happens is current year 120, okay. Last year 120 divided by 13, you will take 40. So 120 plus 40, 160. Then second year 120 divided by 6, it becomes 20. So 180. Since it is 180, it is less than 182. A, you are non-resident. You are non-resident of US. You are not. But maybe you are non-resident. 
if you are a citizen, if you are holding green card, come what may, you have to pay tax on the global income in USA. I, am, I have superficial knowledge of US, but somehow or other, whatever I could uh, understand, I have told you about that knowledge. Of, and you get a credit of only federal income tax. Please, you get a credit of only federal income tax. You don't get a credit of state income tax or you don't get a credit of accumulated earning tax. You don't get a credit of social security tax. It is only federal income tax which you have paid in US. You get a credit in India. And in India, whatever tax you have paid there, you get a credit there, including whatever paid tax they are going to surcharge, including surcharge also, you get a credit in US country. So that point is also maybe kept in mind that you have a benefit of that. I'm coming to two more points before uh, you can. Uh, one is the question was very specifically asked, dividends I've told you, what about if I have a property situated in India or immobile property situated in India, I want to sell that property and there is a capital gain. Where the capital gain will be taxed? Wait a minute. In the treaty also we have said that capital gain will be taxable as per the domestic law of each contracting state. Each contracting state. That means if you have a capital gain in India, we will apply the Indian law. If you have a capital gain in US, we will apply the US law as each contracting state. Now, if you sell a property in India, immovable property first, I think, and it is long-term capital gain, that means you sell it after two years of acquisition, there is a long-term capital gain. It is taxable at the rate of 20% plus surcharge plus education sales. But wait, before you tax it 20%, we give you the benefit of indexation also. Indexation is the benefit of the cost of living index, you get a benefit of that. Because if you had got a property before 2001, 1st April 2001, you are given a liberty to take the market value of that property on 1st April 2001 and take the base year as 100 of 2001. And then up to last year, you could index it by multiplying by 289 divided by 100. So you are given cost of living index benefit also. Index benefit is because of the uh, inflation. That is inflation index benefit. So if you have property bought, let's say, before 2001 for, let's say, 50 lakh. And on 2001, the market value was, let's say, 1 crore. And if you want to sell that, your cost will be 1 crore multiplied by 289 divided by 100, 2 crore 89 lakh. This is last year because current year index has not come. 2 crore 89 lakh. Suppose you have sold it for 5 crore. The tax, the capital gain will be 2 crore 11 lakh. Am I right? 2 crore 11 lakh because 2 crore 89 will be cost index cost of acquisition. 2 crore 89 lakh. So 2 crore 10 lakh, you will have to pay tax in India at the rate of 20% plus surcharge plus education sales. Now, the resident who buys the property from you will deduct the TDS at this rate on the gross consideration price. Please, he will deduct TDS on 5 crore. How does he know what is your capital gain? You have two alternatives in that case. Either you go under section 195.2 and tell the AO of India to reduce this because my capital gain comes out to this amount because calculation will be given by you that it is not two crore, uh, 5 crore, it is 2 crore 80 lakh. Give me that relief. Then you, he can deduct tax only on 2 crore uh, 19 lakh. Uh, 2 crore 11 lakh. But suppose 195.2, do, you don't want to go. But if note, if you have bought the property before, uh, after 2001, then there is no problem. Because you don't have to assume fair market value on 2001 then you can index yourself and they can deduct tax only on the capital gain. Whatever tax you have paid in India on this capital gain, don't worry, this income will also be included in your uh, income of uh, uh, US, and, but you will get the credit, whatever you have got uh, uh, paid in India, you will get, get credit there. This is for capital gain also. Your immobile property situated in India, the rent from that immobile property will be taxable in India, obviously, at the slab rate. Let me tell you for non-resident, 
the slab rate is exemption is rupees 2 lakh 50000 2 lakh 50000 and beyond 2 lakh 50000 you have to pay tax on the next 2 lakh 50000 5% on the next 5 lakh 20% on about 10 lakh 30% and if you have more than 50 lakh income then surcharge 10% if you have more than 1 crore income surcharge 15% i'm taking up to this only i don't want to confuse you a lot but whatever i could gather i have told you you want me to talk to me uh, talk about any other point i can talk to you otherwise most welcome to take any number of questions you want yeah I'll, up to uh, you. you yeah uh, dr ahuja i'll just uh, wrap up a few things uh, for uh, the listeners in us basically to cover the us standpoint and then we'll uh, come come to the questions so basically uh, as far as the residential status uh, as dr ahuja mentioned in us it's uh, basically if you are a green card holder or a citizen then you have to pay tax on global income yeah uh, no matter where you live but there is the second is there a substantial presence test which he mentioned uh, it's uh, 183 days in the current year or 31 days in the current year plus 1/3 in the previous year and 2/3 uh, 1/6 uh, in the in the second year before then there are special rules in the case of dual status residents when people come in a particular year then they file returns as a dual status resident uh, in the year they get green card or they become uh, they move here uh, permanently or they uh, leave the green card they quit the green card and go permanently to india so there are special rules a uh, dual status return can be filed certain categories are exempt in this which is uh, f1 students they are still considered even if they are here 365 days they are considered stu uh, students j j visa holder m visa holder or q uh, visa holder and for uh, this year they have given special exemption for the us residents because of the covid 19 situation about 60 days exemption is there for the us residents purposes and uh, as i think you are in india also sir yeah yeah That and But one thing, right. professors and teachers also, if they stay there for two years, that also is not taxable. They are exempt if they are coming on J1 visa or F1 visa. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Correct. So, they, but but they, it it becomes an interesting situation. The day the year they they change from uh, F1 to H1, then we have a basically a choice to do it. Many times we we calculate the number of days. There are both the options. They can even tax themselves as resident if they include India income, get a credit. Probably sometimes taxes lower. because as a uh, merit uh, as a uh, here in us there is a concept of merit filing joint also whereas the um, uh, dual status residence return then you cannot do a joint return then it has to be single uh, return only uh, as a merit filing separate and then you don't get the benefit of a double exemption based on uh, your spouse and um, as uh, again as uh, with the uh, the other second point which uh, dr ahuja mentioned was the uh, abolition of uh, dividend distribution tax at on the face of it it sounds as if now we have to pay tax in india on the dividend but actually it's a it's a credit because you are getting a, you can also get claim a credit correct for tax which earlier was not uh, available sir can i can i can i yeah. come into yeah yeah sure this has been done especially we recommended this that yeah. foreign country, foreign investors are not interested in coming uh, investing in indian companies because dividend distribution tax is paid by the company and it is not paid by the recipient and they don't get credit in country so this thing to the government let the tax be paid by the recipient because if it is paid by the recipient recipient will get credit of that tax paid in india in foreign country that means in us earlier they were not going that was the reason for bringing this change in the law yes sir please continue yeah, now the next uh, actually point is uh, on this uh, capital gains on the sale of property or investments in india so here i would like to invite you once again to uh, talk, talk a little more about some of the uh, the tax saving options which are there the reason i am saying is because what we ha see here is people come here uh in the us they come okay i have already sold the property in india i have put it in uh, ic bonds and i i'm not taxable over there what should i do here so we basically have to balance in the in the some some of the tax saving options in in india and then in in the us also there are a couple of options so i would like you to uh, first mention the options in india 
uh, for the let's say the property is sold uh, by somebody i did what not mention it intentionally i'll come back i'll come no back. i'll tell because this is where uh, we have a lot of uh, people who are uh, it, it's on a daily basis people sell the property there this uh, they say okay i have um, uh, invested in the bonds or i have done uh, some tax saving so now i shouldn't be paying now they what happens is they they end up paying tax in the the us so on the one hand they have blocked the money over there on the other hand they have to pay tax in the us also so it's correct the law, uh, correct let me tell you the law of india yeah yeah we have one uh, two section called one section is called as 54 section another is called as 54 f, f section what does 654 uh, section says where there is a long term capital gain long term is you sell it after 2 years immobile property from the transfer of any residential house property by an individual or hof that capital gain shall be exempt to the extent it is invested in the purchase of another residential house property within one year before or two years after the date of transfer or in the construction of a new residential house property within three years after the date of such transfer wait what i'm saying you sell a house property residential house property after 2 years you are an individual now you have sold it for 5 crores there is a capital gain let's say of 3 crore 2 crore is the cost to 3 crore the entire 3 crore can be taken as exempt in india if you invest that 3 crore in a house property residential house property you can uh, buy before and also one year before or two years after the date of such transfer or you construct a residential house property within 3 years your entire capital gain in india will be exempt but what will happen of that you will able to pay tax in foreign country us because they don't give you that exemption yeah. that exemption is only in india there is a second case also you sell anything in india long term capital gain sell anything and you earn suppose you have sold it for the shares for 3 crores rupees you have sold share of india you invest this 3 crore in the residential house property within one year before or two years after or construction the entire capital gain on this 3 crore will be exempt but now you have to weigh that you have to weigh that that if it is exempt what is going to be there you will be taxed there secondly if the capital gain is only 50 lakh then we have a system of investing in national highway authority bonds or rural in, uh, infrastructure bond where you get an interest of 5.5% per annum 5.5% but that is taxable but you have taken the exemption of capital gain of 50 lakh that 50 lakh will not be allowed and these days they are not giving benefit to this also to non resident for 54 ec these days they are not giving earlier they were giving but still i am telling you be careful you have taken an exemption in this country but way that amount will be taxable that mr bhatia will tell you how that is taxed in the us thank you yeah so now coming to the as uh, dr hauja mentioned about the tax uh, some of the tax saving options in india but uh, the we have to do on a on a parallel calculation in the us so couple of things which we need to keep in mind here first of all in us there is no indexation so as uh, dr correct. raja mentioned but what indirectly what we can take is a we can take an advantage of a foreign currency difference so if let's say in yeah. 19 2006 the dollar rate was 40 dollars today it's 70 uh, 8 or 77 so we have an almost a 200% or 180 190% 90 indexation so that uh, uh, leverage can be taken so cost will be taken at 40 dollars and sale price will be at 78 so that indirectly that uh, advantage comes a little bit of the inflation at least in the in the currency uh, devaluation then there is one more exemption which if it's in the case of sale of residential property if somebody uh, a us citizen is living in india or a, or a green card holder is living for longer duration over there and he has a house property over there in us you have an exemption if you live in any house for at least 2 years during the last 5 years again up to 500000 can be exempt in the case of joint return and 250000 dollars in the case of single return that exemption will be available even if you are living in india for a longer duration and using it as a primary home so this this factor also has to be taken into account 
Thirdly, if you have an inherited property, now that's where, uh, again, there is an advantage in the US as compared to India. The moment if you inherit the property, the cost of the property is taken as the stepped up basis at fair market value. The reason is in US, we still have uh, estate duty, which India abolished uh, the, the, the estate uh, tax long time back in 80s. 85. 85, yeah. So in US, it is not. So because there is only uh, an estate tax uh, given, although the exemption limit is at uh, 11 million per individual, but still because of that, the cost in the case of inherited property is taken at the step up basis, which is the val fair value at the time of death of the, uh, 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 the person. And so, so basically that advantage is there in US, not in India. Then another interesting concept could be in some states which follow the community property, like California and New York. Even if one spouse dies and it's a community property, the, st the basis is stepped up for the entire property uh, uh, in, in the US. So in those cases, the advantage of uh, India and the US both have to be balanced because maybe in such cases, uh, investing in some tax saving bonds could be an advantage. And there is one more thing which we can take in the case is where uh, if it's a rental property you have in India and uh, you're doing, uh, you're, you're using those advantages. There is a something called a 1031 exchange where an investment property is reinvested in another investment property or a rental property is invested in another rental property. You can do a 1031 exchange and defer the tax. In India, probably in many cases, you are completely avoiding the tax. Here you are deferring the tax. But then it has to be a property outside US, not in the, uh, you can't sell a property in India and uh, a rental property in, U in, in India and buy a rental property in US. So these are some of the things which are, uh, which are to be taken into consideration. And of course, the tax rate for capital gains is uh, starts uh, at, at long term capital gain is uh, for single, it is exempt till 40,000 and for uh, married filing joint up to 80,000 is exempt. And between uh, 40,000 and uh, this is for uh, 2020 rates because it, it gets adjusted for inflation every year. And for single from 40,000 to 441,000, it's in 15 percent bracket for married filing uh, joint, it is 80,000 to 496,000, close to 500,000, it's in 15% uh, bracket, and it's 20% beyond that. So these are some of the factors of, of balancing has to be done uh, uh, between India tax and US. And of course, you can get a credit only for the federal tax, not the, the state tax or any, any local tax. So uh, obviously, uh, because generally what happens is somebody walks in, he says, okay, well, I'm selling the property. What, what, should, what, uh, what uh, my friend did, did this, should I do the same thing? Every case, every factor has, is different. Everyone has their own factors, circumstances, and those need to be balanced uh, both in US and uh, India terms. So, and one more factor which comes in is the remittance of from, from India. That really is, uh, is an issue because everyone asks, then uh, they are paying tax in India. Uh, and then they, uh, uh, after that, they want the money to be transferred uh, from India to the US. They need to get a certificate from a chartered accountant uh, in Form 15CB and uh, another Form 15CA has to be submitted to the tax department. And so, uh, so those things have to be uh, taken into consideration. Sir, but you are allowed to take $1 million Correct. every year. Yeah. Baki taking a 50 CB is not a very big thing. Right. That, that's correct. <laughs> ah. But again, they have to be, it, it has to be tax paid many times. It's they, all online they're they're business now in India. Yeah. But, but many times they are not filing the return. They just get some deposits and all that. So those factors are there. So somewhere they have to establish before a, a CA also. So I had a question, sir, Dr. Ahuja. If uh, somebody is selling a property and it's actually yeah. selling at a loss, does he still have to, uh, will there be a TDS still to be deducted or there can be an exemption? Point is, there are two ways. If you have bought a property after 2001, then you can, and you have not done any improvement, is a cost is there. Then you can index that and then calculate the capital gain or loss. No problem, no TDS, because working can be there. Because your, your uh, registration deed will show how much is the cost. But if you have bought property before 2001, because you are allowed to opt for 2001 market value, and how, how correct it is that you are opting for market value is correct. And then you have to index it. So therefore, they don't allow you. Then in that case, we have a section 195 to 
you have to make an application to the AO online these days, of course, and he will you will have to give all those calculations to him, and he will give you a certificate for tax to be deducted at lower rate. Absolutely no problem. 1952 is there, and we have also one application in Form 30. We call it Section 197, where you can tell them to take a certificate from AO for deduction of tax at lower rate. So there are two ways. Yes, if somebody you will have to take a help of someone. You can have to take a help of someone. Now Mr. Bhatia is there and his brother is in India. He can always take a benefit of that. And you can always do that. And you can go apply for that through that. And you can get a benefit. Let me tell you. Let me tell you it is possible. Otherwise, if it is after 2001, there is no problem. Even if there is a capital loss, no need to deduct TDS. But working should be very correct. Otherwise, you will be held responsible. The Indian citizen will be held responsible for not deducting the tax. So that is the issue which I wanted to tell. So in this case, who will be applying to the AO? The, uh, uh, yeah, well, uh, yeah. uh, 195 to the local man can apply. But 130, uh, form 13, well, 197, the non-resident has to. Right. In 195 to the local man can apply by taking details from you. Mm -hmm. But normally he doesn't want to do it. He said, why should I take that trouble? I will deduct the TDS and my job is over. But if you have something, it can be done. But let me tell you the property which have been acquired after 2001, where the cost is known, you are not allowed to opt for market value and you have not done any improvement. You can certainly index yourself and calculate tax. And if there is a loss, no TDS. If there is an income, you can deduct TDS only on that capital gain, not on the total amount. Uh, okay, so now we don't have too much uh, time. I think we can just quickly uh, touch upon one or two uh, things. There is uh, another change called equalization le levy. Just briefly, yeah. you can tell. This is uh, equivalent to something we have in the US the last year which is we uh, have been we have right. done equalization levy two years back one but this is another one now right. there are two types of equalization levy we have in India first thing if a, in, if the city a resident of India has taken any uh, advertisement done any uh, advertisement in the uh, foreign uh, uh, foreign uh, place uh, on uh, online the, uh, advertisement or taken any digital uh, space of a non-resident online uh, portal, he has taken an advertisement space or he has advertised there or taken a digital place for advertisement. They're like Google, if you have taken. Now, if that amount exceeds 1 lakh in India, he has to deduct 6% as equalization levy while making the payment to Google or any other portal there outside. 6% equalization levy. He has to pay. But if now, most of the time I've seen they don't pay. They said, we are not concerned. We will charge only one, uh, let's say $50,000, but we are not going to give the tax to you. Then in that case, the TDS will be deposited by the T uh, uh, Indian resident from his own pocket. But by doing that, he'll have to gross up the amount. That, you know, on 100, you have paid six. So you will calculate not only 100, you will gross up the amount and then calculate 6%. That the duty of the resident of India who has made a payment of exceeding 1 lakh to outside India and that advertisement is for business purposes. Business purposes. And that uh, portal which is outside India does not have permanent establishment in India. If they have permanent establishment in India, there is no problem. If they don't have permanent establishment in India, then we are under an obligation to deduct TDS at the rate of 6% by making the payment. And if I do from my own pocket, grossing up of that. Coming to the new one, e-commerce operator, a non-resident e-commerce operator sitting in US. Now, if he makes a supply, e-commerce supply or render services, or he facilitate the e-commerce supply or services to a resident in India, the service is made to a resident in India, then e-commerce operator sitting there abroad abroad non-resident will have to pay equalization levy at the rate of 2%. 2% provided his total turnover exceeds 2 crore. 2% of the gross amount. 
that if there is an e-commerce portal outside India, let's say Amazon outside India, not in India, outside India. You know, you have two types of portal. One is called Indian portal, another is called foreign portal. Indian portal is always, we start with IN. And in the foreign portal, we have Amazon.com. But in India, we have Amazon.in. Whatever I'm saying, if you are using a foreign portal, e-commerce operator supplying to any resident in India goods or services, e-commerce operator will have to pay tax at 2% in India. Quarterly, quarterly to be paid. If the total turnover exceeds 2 crore, second. Total turnover of the whole business of the e-commerce operator, not only for this. Or he renders certain uh, specified services to non-resident there. Then also here, or he supply goods to any person, but that eco that person has used Indian portal address, Indian portal address. Then in that case, also e-commerce operator will have to pay two percent equalization levy with effect from one four twenty twenty. So if let's say Messi, they are a storehouse, they have also e-commerce. Uh, let's say portal and if I place an order on Messi if I place an order turnover obviously is definitely more than 2 crore there is absolutely nothing if I place an order to the Messi for Messi product Messi supplies me now the Messi will have to pay 2% on the value consideration received from me 2% will have to pay in India in India but suppose Messi there is marketing other product also of other persons also. Then he is facilitating that portal. He is facilitating the portal of supply of goods or services. Then whenever payment is made to the Messi, Messi will charge some commission or some on commission they will have to pay 2%. But suppose I advertise in India at Messi portal there and I place an order by using internal uh, in, uh, internet of the India then in that case, Messi will have to pay tax on the commission which they charge at the rate of 2%. It's a new concept which has come. One was tedious deducted if I give advertisement in a foreign portal. Advertisement in a foreign portal. That is 6% we started two years back, rather three years back, 2016. Maybe you copied from us, sir, because we started this equalization from 2016 and not uh, uh, 18, but this has been started today of e-commerce operator who are non-resident. Non-resident e-commerce operator. If he's a resident e-commerce, now look here, one more thing. If e-commerce operator is making a payment to e-commerce participant of a resident of India, please, please, there, uh, there, let's say, uh, my I have, have a company, I have advertised in the portal, uh, portal of uh, what you call uh, Amazon US. Amazon US, somebody placed the order, Amazon US. They placed the order, but it is using my portal. Uh, 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 order is given there. Look here. They will have to deduct even the payment which is made to me, a tax under Indian law, TDS, under section 194O while making a payment by e-commerce operator who is outside India, if he makes to a payment to e-commerce participant in India, it will become his duty to deduct the TDS at the rate of 2% and deposit with the central government of India. Please, first time, 204 section, where a non-resident has been, uh, it has been responsible for deducting the tax on payment made to e-commerce participant in India. It's a new thing which I'm telling you. First time it has happened that if you are in US e-commerce operator, you are making a payment because it is sold through you. You are making a payment to e-commerce participant in India. So in that case, whatever payment you made, 2% of, uh, of, sorry, not 2%. 1% uh, of will be deducted as tedious by e-commerce operator there and deposit in India, either himself or through an agent in India. It's a new concept 194. I'm not talking about the another concept of equalization levy. Equalization is he, he, he has to pay tax in India at the rate of 2%. This is 
Indian payment pay, payment made to Indian part, uh, participant, e-commerce participant. He will deduct tax at one percent and deposit in India. So these are the two amendments. One I have told you about equalization levy. Another I have told you e-commerce operator, non-resident making payment to e-commerce participant in India. In India, my product uh, sold by him uh, uh, or facilitated by him. He makes a payment to me. He makes a payment to me. You may say no. He doesn't make a payment to me. I get a payment directly from purchaser. Still, that amount will be included, and he will have to deduct TDS at the rate of one percent. A new concept has come. It's a very difficult concept, but I have tried to make it as simple as I can. So uh, this actually uh, in the U.S. this uh, whole fight used to be for the the, the state's autonomy issue. So in 2018, there was a case, uh, South Dakota versus Bayfair, where uh, Supreme Court actually overruled uh, the, uh, the, the defense of Commerce Clause and the uh, Due Process Clause in the US. And after that, this big, basically, it was like the states could not uh, uh, tax an out-of-state uh, 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 entity uh, uh, in that state. But in this case, uh, it was like a historic uh, judgment. It was... Uh, Overruled, and the Supreme Court uh, ruled that the physical presence rule is not a necessary interpretation of the requirement that a state tax must be applied to an activity with a substantial nexus with the taxing state. So, in this case, basically, uh, uh, the, 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 the uh, South Dakota was imposing tax on sales made in their state for by outside the state sellers. So now most of the states have started following this and started imposing uh, tax on the uh, uh, sales which are made within the within the state. So as a as a ne ne next corollary to this, everyone has started coming with a with a new concept which is called a market facilitator uh, concept. And pretty much the market facilitator is the definition uh, very much like uh, what uh, what India we are pursuing. Anybody. Uh, we, uh, Dr. Hoja was mentioning about uh, India. Basically, anybody who is uh, uh, transmitting or otherwise communicating through uh, any uh, any online portal, uh, uh, through any electronic portal, or using uh, providing a virtual currency for transaction or payment processing service, or any software development or R&D activity which is related to payment processing or any fulfillment of uh, storage, or uh, uh, order pro procuring or uh, listing of the product for sale. Um, uh, basically setting up prices, order taking, all these uh, or any branding of a sale, all these are called market facilitators and uh, they are, uh, uh, let's say in, in California, they have put up 500,000 threshold. So anybody crossing the th threshold has to uh, uh, pay tax. So basically what they have done is they have shifted the owners from marketplace seller to a marketplace facilitator. So anybody, even though you are holding a portal, which is just facilitating a transaction through your portal, even if the purchase and sale is not made by you or you're just getting a commission, the onus has been put on the on, on you if you are a, you fall within that definition of the marketplace uh, facilitator. This is the change from 2019, October 2019. So, uh, one question I had, Dr. Auja, uh, there is a, also uh, now a new concept of... Uh, Neeraj, can I interject? Uh, on, uh, uh, yeah. Sorry about that. You know, we have to uh, as a, be mindful of the time as well. Yeah, so I think it's a quick uh, one or two questions and then uh, we can, we can there, go into the thing. There is okay. a, one more new... Yeah, it's on uh, tax collection and source on remittance because that's another uh, thing people... Yeah. Maybe want. If they have to get uh, money, but that is only for resident. No, no, resident sending money out a liberated scheme, not non resident. The my scheme is only for no uh, collection TCS, the deduction of TCS. Okay. I think if, uh, yeah, no, it's... there's no TCS, it is liberalized remittance scheme for resident. If I send money to US okay. for education, my children, I send money. I send okay. money. And if it is more than seven lakh in a year, now while sending the money, they will deduct five, uh, will have, they will collect 5%. 5 percent. 5 percent of the amount sent by me, not for a non resident. It is only for resident sending money outside India, which I am allowed to send up to two lakh fifty thousand dollars per year under liberalized remittance scheme. So if I send to for children education, then, then they have given one concession. If I borrowed the money from financial institution for education of my children out, then the TCS is not 5%, it is 0.5%. 0.5%. Okay. 
point five. The so, DCS I'll get credit in India, but that is only resident sending money. So not non-resident. Start moves to India with that 120 days or 180 days rule, and he sends money to US. He will have to pay the tax on the remittance. Then that status change has an implication there. That is. But once you come to India, non-resident external account. If you have to come yeah. and stay here for right. unspecified period, then non-resident external account has to be converted into NFC. Right. Non uh, uh, RFC rather. Rupee, right. uh, what you call resident financial currency account, uh, foreign currency account, resident right. financial uh, foreign currency account, which is taxable. Let me tell you. Right. Okay. Now we've got some questions. Uh, we received a few questions uh, before, and so let me just read those out. Uh, first question was how to save tax on long-term capital gain on sale of residential property, and how much? Explain, sir. Yes. Yeah, we've already done. That. You have also explained. Yeah. Right. Other, uh, I, I have added to my knowledge a lot of things. <laughs> Are there changes applicable to U.S. citizens too? Um, I guess um, it's it's the same as uh, so. Basically, what you have already answered, sir. You have yeah. already answered, right? Mm -hmm. uh, then, um, what about there's one question? Setu is asking details of F bar FATCA. This is a basically I would just summarize that there there are options available. Basically, if somebody has not been filing, they need to. Uh, come through a streamlined process which is open. Uh, we will not have much time to go through the detail. And uh, Mr. Basant Kumar uh, Dugar asked, do US India tax treaties having any tax, uh, I think he meant foreign tax credit probably this is on interest, dividend, profits, etc. I think I've told you. Yeah, there are uh, tax, uh, uh, I think uh, you covered already. Uh, Mr. VD Gree is asking, hello, can you please cover India tax for resident OCIs for their US income? If I become a resident in India in 2020, so will there be any tax in India? So I think we, that also you've covered. Yeah. Right. Uh, next, Mahesh Kumar, he has a question on repatriation of funds to US from sale of inherited property in India. I think this also we covered. You have explained that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then Mr. Sachin Agrawal has a question. How is withdrawal of PF due to relocation treated per tax laws in India? And Are, US, if you, if you relocate is, after five years, there is absolutely no problem. After five years. But if before five years, there is a system where you can get exemption also. For, because if, it is, if, you are, if you are for a fixed period of time, if you were here for a fixed period of time, in that case also, if your period was three years or four years, that year also it is exempt. But if you are not here for a fixed period of time, then in case after five year withdrawal is fully exempt. But before five year, it is taxable. So, and from the US standpoint, I think we need to be careful in calculating this basically whether we are reporting income year wise, because if we do not do it, there is a chance that the moment we, uh, uh, we, uh, we get the remittance, it, uh, in, it is in cash the entire period uh, from the uh, maybe tax. So it's best to, report some income or uh, the gain uh, year wise it is due from the time it, uh, somebody moves to us right uh, next question anil kumar i'm a us citizen so do i have to file tax return in india i think that depends upon i think the income threshold if your income is about 250000 you are supposed to file yeah um Manikam from Coim uh, Manikam Coimbatore is asking, what if my investments in India have breached the FPAR and FATCA limits and I have failed to report uh, in US? He is in India. I, he can ask me anytime later. Yeah. No, no. I think uh, that's his name. He is here. You said Coimbatore. Oh, I think that probably is his last name. I am not sure. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay, okay. Okay. Yeah. So I think he is asking. So if they have breached, I think uh, um, the, the options are uh, to go through a streamlined process. It's a it's a whole new subject which. Uh, uh, we can cover uh, sometimes later and I'll pass on to Geeta. There are some questions which are uh, there, I think, in the chat window also. Yes, thank you very much, Neeraj. Actually, um, I'm, many of these have already been answered, but uh, there's a lot of questions around interest income from banks. Um, um, you know, can we take credit for TDS that has already been deducted and what kind of forms uh, should we get from the banks? Is that something? Yes. That yeah, we can we can get a foreign tax credit on the interest which we are paying in India, and they normally we use the form 16 which the banks are issued. We we calculate uh, depending. 16A. On, uh, we call it 16A. 16A. Yeah. Excellent. Form 16A. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. The next. And we have 26 AS. We have 26 AS form also which can be downloaded 
and there the whole details are there. It, uh, you can download for your uh, registered portal of India. You right. download it 26 years. That also gives you the credit for that. So you don't but, have to rely on the bank. You can actually download it yourself from. Uh, but correct. Uh, but but there's correct. a. There's a there's a writer. I'll tell you if the those individuals are also filing return in India and claiming the refund back over there, then they should not be claiming. Yeah, that point is to be done. Yeah, yeah. or or only to that extent they will not be able to get it. Correct, and or at the time of filing the return, they still are paying more tax. They can get a credit for the additional taxes. The better is the copy of the income tax return. Also. Right. Yeah. They Correct. Thank you. Uh, Shweta Sagar has a question on um, capital gains. Um, so uh, she has paid capital gains tax in India and she uh, is asking if we can claim credit. I think we went over that. Uh, I th uh, well, I'm not entirely sure if it's uh, movable or immovable properties, but I believe that uh, movable properties we went Doesn't make any difference. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. In both the cases we can. Both the cases we can claim tax credit. Uh, indexation benefits are available in India and you were talking about the foreign uh, currency um, uh, forex uh, differential yeah correct the only only thing i'll tell you the foreign tax credit in us is calculated in different buckets one is separate for active income like if somebody is working also getting any salary uh, working in india getting salary income or a business income and the other is the passive income which includes interest dividend uh, rental income or capital gains so those are uh, the the buckets cannot be mixed but they are they can be claimed they can be claimed even if yes. they've already been paid it's not yeah Correct. okay yeah they, you right. can get a credit for That's the tax paid uh, that i think that answers the question um I, i'm just scanning through my questions uh, can you apply the treaty rate for some sources of income and the indian income tax act for other sources of income in the same yes. investment year yes 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 you can do it Excellent. You can do it. Yes, you are allowed. Okay, thank you. Um, I think that about summarizes the questions that we have. Uh, I think most of the others have been answered. And I guess uh, not a minute too soon. Anura, how are we doing on time? I think we are just dot on time. I, just two minutes is not. <laughs> <laughs> We're just two minutes over. So uh, I th think uh, uh, with uh, that, you know, uh, Neeraj, if you have, yeah. you know. Uh, no, I think I would uh, like to thank uh, Dr. Ahuja for giving his valuable time. I know it's, he's, he's been extremely busy, but just quick as a wrap up question. Now we, uh, how do we uh, see, uh, one question I have been curious to ask, what, since you've been part of the drafting the tax act, what are we hearing about uh, in terms of ease of doing business because a lot of difficulty is uh, faced by the foreign investors uh, in, in terms of uh, Sir, we ventures. have given lot of lot of advantage in your we are, we are, FDI is now uh, automatic route they can come 100% automatic route also the FDI people can come and they can invest in India and shares you know in uh, bonds and all those things we have given the benefit to the FPI also to invest more than 10% also there we have right. been giving benefit, but at the same time, let me tell you, mm -hmm. there are all types of people, all types of people. People have shifted from India and gone abroad just for a different <laughs> reason. I you know. understand what I'm saying? Money laundering, they have taken the money in right. a wrong means. They, have, they, have, they don't want to give the details of the power because of Black Money Act, which came in 2015. Now, they don't want to give the details of the foreign income. They have not given amnesty scheme. They did not avail. So they said, let me become non-resident. And once I am non-resident, so yeah, then they will not be become non-resident. And because of that non-resident, we had to not come to India for more than one one nine days. Because people, there are Indians are very clever. Let me tell you, they have mind to apply. They are really mind to apply. They can do anything. One joke, <laughs> all the last minute I can tell you, and then we will close. You know, four chartered accountants and four engineers were traveling the train. When you meet in the train, you know, you start talking to each other very smooth. So the engineer, the chartered accountant, who are you, sir? We are engineers. And engineer, who are you, sir? We are chartered. Oh, you are chartered accountant? You must have done planning. You do planning. He said, yes, we do planning every time. Then what is the planning you have done today? Sir, we have taken only one ticket. We are four chartered accountants, taken one ticket. How it is possible? He said, wait and watch. 
the TT comes, all the charter are going to go to one toilet. He knocks at the door, one hand comes out, he shows the ticket, and he walks away. And then the, the engineers were really sorry, what kind of a planning you have done? Wonderful. Then they again met, they were traveling from Mumbai to Pune. This time engineers are also very happy. What happened? Sir, we have also taken one ticket this time. How many tickets you have taken? Sir, we have not taken any ticket. How it is possible? He said, we can watch. The TT comes. Four charter go to one toilet, four Indians go to another toilet. One uh, charter comes out, knocks at the door of the engineer, ticket please, and takes the ticket and goes to his toilet. <laughs> what a planning they have done. <laughs> again, they again meet in Bombay. Now traveling from Andheri to uh, Church Gate in a local train. Again, they said, no, no, we don't want to talk to you now because you are always putting us into difficulty. Engineer said, how many tickets you have taken? He answered, one ticket. Engineer said, sir, how many tickets you have taken? Chartered account? Sir, we have taken four tickets. What is this? One time you took one, now zero. Now you have taken four tickets. What is the reason? He says, wait and watch. The TT comes. The, the engineers are looking for a toilet. There is no toilet in the local tree, let me tell you, in India. <laughs> so therefore, you have to apply your mind. And people in India do apply their mind. And they have mind to apply. So just a joke, it is just an anecdote. Please don't take it seriously. I just want you to do on a happy note. Thank you very much, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hauja, for giving your valuable time at this uh, busy hour. And uh, I want to thank both on behalf of the Institute of uh, Chartered Accountants, San Francisco chapter, as well as uh, uh, on behalf of Indo-American Chamber of Commerce, and also all the participants who have uh, taken their valuable time at evening hour. It must be dinner time for people in US and very early on in India. So, But we had to balance out the time for, for convenience of everyone. So look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Stay Thank you, everyone. Yeah. All the Good best. Night. Take care, sir. sir take Bye. care. Thank you.